Okay. So it started recording, right? Yep. Okay, hey, welcome everyone to the first Colloquium after our vacation. And it's a great pleasure for us to have with us Professor Shurud More, the first uh, not Bengali speaking Colloquium speaker in the School of Athletics. That's probably some success. We are really happy that he traveled from Ayuka last night to just particularly speak to the presidency folks. So, uh, and uh, as a student, uh, did, so Professor More did his undergraduate work, and undergraduate studies at RIT Bombay, and he was in the famous some of you know, the engineering physics program. We had uh, many physicists, uh, Indian physicists coming out from the IIT engineering physics program, and of course, Surud is one of the uh, top people from this program, and then he did his PhD uh, at uh, MPA, talking. No, MPIA. MPIA, sorry, MPIA. MPI. <laughs> MPI. And then he went to the University of Chicago as the ICP postdoc, and after that, he was an IPAD fan, uh, first as a senior postdoc, and then as a, as a faculty before he joined Ayuka in 2016. 18, 18, 18 okay. just recently. In 2018, <laughs> uh, we are really lucky that uh, Sudhu came uh, and joined Ayuka, and now he's part of the uh, Indian fraternity of cosmologists. Now, just one anecdote about Sudhu, because both of you have present in the last colloquium before the break, that was Sudhu Dutta Chaudhuri, uh, who is also a student of Frank Frank and Bosch. And so he was one of the uh, first, first students of Frank when Frank was in Germany. And uh, my first discussion of so Frank, well, Frank was a faculty member at Yale when I was a postdoc there. So I heard, the first time I heard Surut Mores, Surut Mores name is to, so, well, I heard Surut's name before because I read I saw his papers. But I think my first interaction with Frank was uh, the connection with Sulu because uh, he said, oh, you are from India. You know, I had this Indian student, the most brilliant, brilliant person I ever met. said, who is this? I think, so, Sulud. And he said, more and more, what is the last thing? Well, last thing is that he said, oh, more, Sulu, more. said, oh, he was so tremendous, brilliant, I mean, so much about me. I never had a student of this caliber and all that. And so when the uh, who went to get I was like, my God, these Indian students' expectation <laughs> is at the level of students. So I hope that uh, you go and then some other students probably meet that expectation. And I'm very glad to say that recently uh, he was on one of the papers of one of our masters to Shore Department. And we did some interesting work together. And Sulut does work on gravitational lensing and many other projects, which we're going to hear today. So before uh, making it more lengthy, we welcome Professor More to tell us about cosmology and astrophysics from the Subaru, which is an optical telescope, AJC CERN. Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you so much, Jetma. Uh, that was uh, an introduction which would re really require me to put my, put my hands on my face. Um, yeah, and I'm pretty sure that Frank has much better students nowadays, especially from presidency, given that, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's really great to see, to be here at presidency and see all the history. Um, you guys are part of uh, um, the places, which it's not just at the forefront of Kolkata, but uh, at the forefront of the, uh, of the country itself, right? And so um, it's really beautiful and um, it's, it's, it's a great feeling to be here. Um, and sometimes I feel very odd that I have never visited Kolkata before. This is my first time. Uh, and so you have done a great job in impressing <laughs> on what a great city this is. Um, so um, let's get to the talk. So today I'm going to talk about cosmology and astrophysics uh, from the Subaru HSC survey. Uh, I'm Surud More from Mayuka. And uh, um, I got involved in the Subaru HSC survey uh, when I moved to Japan in uh, 20, 2012. Okay. So at that point, particular point of time, uh, this was uh, uh, a survey which was going to start with the Subaru telescope. And I'll explain what this Subaru telescope is, why it is so interesting. Uh, 
Um, and that was the thing which attracted me to Japan at that point of time. And I'm really happy that this uh, connection has gone on for such a long time. So I'll uh, show some of these results here. Uh, the other thing is, uh, of course, even though I'm presenting these results, uh, the work that I'm going to present is on behalf of the HSC survey collaboration as a whole. Uh, and so it's not just my uh, own work. It is uh, work and effort of all these colleagues that you are seeing here, uh, various different faces. Uh, the Subaru HSC survey is uh, particularly a collaboration between uh, Japan, Taiwan, and then Princeton University. So it's like two big countries and then a university in US uh, all involved together in this particular survey. So it takes a lot of people uh, uh, to get some of these uh, results out. And so you will hear about them and the contributions. So let's start with the uh, very young universe and how it looks like, right? So um, I'm pretty sure this is a very famous picture. So it does not need an introduction. But the cosmic microwave background is the earliest pictures that you can take with photons. Right? And uh, when you look at the cosmic microwave background, uh, what you see is just isotropy everywhere. The temperature uh, uh, that you see for the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, is the same irrespective of which direction you look at. Uh, but when you take out this isotropic uh, temperature background, then what you are left with are anisotropies. So things where there is a small difference here and there in between the temperature coming from one direction and the other direction. So this map that you are seeing is one of these earliest maps. It was taken by the Planck Sackler. Um, and you can see all these initial density fluctuations which are present in the universe. It is these initial density fluctuations that then go on to develop uh, and become big large scale structures that we see today. Things like galaxies, uh, stars, all of them, they have to form out of these kind of fluctuations, right? If the universe was completely isotropic, it would have been boring. We would not exist here, uh, but this is the reason why we exist. Right? So you can look at these maps and try to understand what is the universe made up of okay? and what is its composition. Um, and you can try to study each of these constituents of the universe by looking at the uh, temperature fluctuations and the statistics of these temperature fluctuations. And what you find uh, is a big surprise, right? That our universe, as we call it, is actually an unknown universe rather than a universe, right? So things that we don't understand actually make up a bulk of the universe, about 95% of it is made up of things that we really don't understand. We don't understand anything about dark matter in terms of what is its particle nature and where is it coming from. We do understand that it's there and this is the amount, about 26% of uh, the matter in the universe or 26% uh, of the energy density in the universe is made up of this dark matter. And then we also don't understand this rest of this pie, pie chart, which is about 68%, which is uh, this component called dark energy. And it is something which causes the uh, accelerated expansion of the universe. And so it's also mysterious. We don't have any particle physics uh, candidate for what uh, this dark energy could be. Okay? So trying to understand dark matter and dark energy is one of the biggest challenges for cosmology today. So how is dark matter distributed? What is it made up of? Um, is it some particular particle or could it be some primordial black holes which are making up this dark matter is an unknown thing. So we'd like to understand this. The rest of these 5% is something which we well understand and the standard model of particle physics applies. But we are left with seeing this and trying to infer about the rest of this. Okay? So that's the, uh, that's the main problem that we have got. So you looked at the early universe picture. Now let me show you one of the later universe pictures as to how the galaxies in the universe look like, right? So if you uh, go to a big telescope like Subaru and take a picture, this is what you will see, right? Big, beautiful galaxies and lots and lots of them as well. Some which are yellowish in color, some which are bluer in color, depending upon how far they are from us. Uh, so we take a look at this picture and we, are, we have to ask, how did this universe, which had very small in homogeneities, how does it turn into this particular complicated picture, right? So that's what we would like to understand. Now, um, we have a background uh, for what uh, the, um, uh, what dark matter distribution should do, okay? So if you can start with a dark matter distribution in the universe and you give it fluctuations, which are consistent with the initial picture that I showed you from Planck. 
So you take those dark matter fluctuations and you evolve them to today. So what happens is you start with some initial fluctuations which are very tiny, but then because dark matter is matter, it interacts gravitationally. Oh, what happened? Okay. It interacts uh, gravitationally. And so wherever there is a little bit more of dark matter, you will start to see it that it starts to clump because it's attractive in nature. So it starts to clump more and more. So you can see that uh, there are bigger and bigger structures which are forming as you go on from the early universe to the later part of the universe. Now, uh, when this growth of structure is happening, it is actually a cosmic tug of war. Okay? So there's dark matter on the one hand, which is trying to clump matter together so as to grow these inhomogeneities, grow these fluctuations and make them more and more uh, bigger. While there is dark energy on the other hand, which is trying to pull apart the universe, which is causing this accelerated expansion of the universe. So especially at later times, what you start to notice is that there is a tug of war between the two. One of them is trying to make it uh, uh, become uh, more and more inhomogeneous, while the other one is trying to pull it apart and keep it from, uh, from growing. Right? And so if you can map out how this dark matter is distributed in the universe at different epochs, then you can learn about the composition of the universe. You can try to understand how much dark matter is there, how much of these fluctuations are there, and how much dark energy is there, what is uh, this cosmic tug of war, you can actually get a front seat so that you can see how this structure is forming as a function of time. So what you would like to do is to measure dark matter as a function of time. And once you do that, then you will be able to learn about the universe, you can learn about the cosmological time. So what you would like to do is the measurement of this large scale structure and its growth and learn about the properties of dark matter and dark energy. Planet. Okay, so the tool that I'm going to use um, is for gravitational lensing. Now this is a very uh, well known phenomena because uh, it's a classical prediction of general theory of relativity. Um, Einstein in his first days, he actually calculated that if you look at light, um, and its path uh, through vacuum. If it goes near a massive object, then you will see that the path of this light, it, uh, uh, it get the, the light itself gets deflected. And so the path does not remain straight. And so there are multiple interesting phenomena that can happen just because of this. Okay? Um, you, uh, you are definitely used to things like lenses, which also bend the path of light, right? The physical lenses that you know of. Uh, but these kind of lenses, uh, they also do a similar kind of thing, which is the deflection of light. But because of this deflection of light, there are some interesting phenomena that can happen. So for example, there is an object which is very far away from us. And then there is a massive object in between. And we are sitting, say, here. And we are observing that distant source. What can happen is that the light coming from that source, it can take multiple paths while reaching us. Okay? It need not just travel along one path. It can take multiple different paths. And if it takes multiple different paths, then you see multiple images of the same object. So that is what is gravitational lensing in its strong form. So in strong gravitational lensing, you can see multiple images of an object. So let me show you an example here. So this particular object is uh, a quasar. Okay. Um, and a quasar is basically a, a, a massive black hole, which is, um, which is gobbling up gas and that's why causing all this emission. And if you look at it, this is a big cluster of galaxies. And then around it, you see these four different quasars. Right? And you, are, uh, you, you start to wonder why are these four quasars so close to each other? Typically quasars uh, are so, um, the number densities are so low that you don't expect like four quasars in the same field of view to come. Okay? So then you go on and you try to fingerprint each of these quasars and you realize, oh, they are at the same distance. In fact, if you study their variability, how these quasars are changing as a function of time, you also notice a pattern that this quasar, one of these quasars will vary one first, then the second one will follow suit, then the third one, and then the fourth one. So um, this is how you identify that it is actually the same source, which is then getting lens. So it's gravitational lensing, which is acting um, uh, uh, in here, in practice, and causing the formation of these multiple images. Okay. So, um, 
these are extreme systems okay so if you want multiple images to form then the alignment between the lens which is this object here right and the source which are these things it has to be near perfect so that quasar should be um, uh, the real position of the quasar should be very close or uh, directly behind uh, this particular galaxy here okay and when it is so close then light can take these four different paths and come towards you and these paths are the ones which actually require the least amount of time to reach us okay yeah Yes. So, what is the, is there any advantage? In, uh, I mean, obviously, there is the advantage of lens, but I am saying what I am asking is that. So, if we are observing the quasar four different times, can we say something more about the quasar properties and something like that? Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, you can learn about the sizes of these quasar disks and so on um, using strong lensing observations. And there have been multiple studies, although I am not going to talk about it uh, today on this. Yeah. 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 So in the galaxy catalog, there will be four different sources because uh, the SDSS catalog itself will not distinguish or try to model them as a uh, single source. Right? So in the catalog, you will see them labeled as four different sources. But, yeah. but physically, we know that uh, these are the same exact, same exact. Okay. Good. So this was about strong gravitational lensing. Um, in addition to strong gravitational lensing, there's also this component, which is called weak gravitational lensing. And that is the component that I'm going to talk to you about today. Right? Um, and you can imagine, uh, given from the name itself, strong gravitational lensing means something strong must be happening. While in terms of weak gravitational lensing, the effects that you see are expected to be. So that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. So what you are seeing here is the observed sky as we see here today, okay? But then uh, these blobs that you're seeing with different colors, these are the positions of galaxies in three dimensional space so that you know where the light is coming from. Then uh, in between these galaxies, you see these ghost-like structures. Those are the dark matter. We don't know what they are. So they look like ghosts here. Right? And then um, the, the pipes that you see here are actually light bundles. So there are galaxies and each of these galaxies, they are emitting light bundles. And these light bundles are coming from the galaxy and towards us. Okay. Now, when these galaxies travel, uh, when the light travels, or, or these light bundles travel through space, then because of the presence of this dark matter distribution, uh, they get deflected. Okay. So now the light is getting deflected. Along with these, these light bundles that are there, they are also getting distorted. And so the shape that you see today from your telescope will look something like this, while the original shape was something like this. Okay. So the original shape and the shape that you observe, they don't remain the same. Okay. There is some distortion which is introduced because of the presence of this dark matter in between us and these galaxies. Okay. So rather than seeing multiple images, now you're seeing just distortion. And the reason for this is again, this alignment. If the alignment is really perfect, then you can see multiple images. Uh, and the density of the medium in between or the lens in between also has to be high. But if that is not the case, then you definitely always see this weak lensing. Okay. Now, um, uh, you, can, you can look at these pictures and what you can realize is that if you look at this galaxy here and this galaxy here, all of this lensing is happening because of the same structure. Right? And so now the kind of distortions that are imprinted on these galaxies, they are correlated. Which means if you know what the distortion looks like here and you know the matter here, then you can predict what the distortion should be on the other side. So they start to become correlated because both of them are being lensed by the same structure. So that is what we are trying to use and we can use in order to figure out what is the dark matter in between us and them. Now there's another interesting thing, which is gravitational lensing is very efficient for matter, which is roughly halfway between us and the source. And because this is the case, if you can measure the shapes of these galaxies at different locations, so you are seeing these blue galaxies, which are really far away, then you can use these in between green galaxies, then the yellowish galaxies here, you can use them separately. You can measure their lensing signal, 
the small distortions of their shapes and then try to figure out what is the matter in between these yellow galaxies and us, these green galaxies and us, and these blue galaxies and us. So this is like doing a tomographic uh, map of where the dark matter is. Okay. And now you can easily see, uh, just a moment, let me complete this thought, then I'll come back to you. So now you can easily see um, that you can learn about the growth of uh, structure in dark matter by using weak lensing. So you just use galaxies at different locations, you measure the weak lensing signal, and that allows you to figure out how dark matter is growing through the universe. Yes. I'm sorry? Uh, so, uh, if you study general relativity, then uh, based on the equivalence principle itself, you can show uh, that um, if you are in an accelerated field, then you, light should not travel in a straight line. Okay. Yeah, so there is a very famous thought experiment by Einstein in which uh, you take, uh, you, you consider um, a, a person who is uh, in a spaceship, which is accelerating upwards. And then you shine a light uh, in the horizontal direction. You will start to see that in the frame of uh, reference of this accelerating spaceship, you will see that there is a deflection in the path of light. Light does not travel in a straight line. Okay. Yeah. I can show you a cartoon picture later on. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay. So then uh, let me show you how these distortions look like, right? In in reality. So what you are seeing showing here, I'm showing here. Uh, in the left-hand picture is a picture of galaxies, which are all having uniform shapes, say circular shapes for the moment, so that we keep it simple. And uh, what I did then later on is to put a blob of dark matter mass, which is right in the middle of this picture, okay? And what these green galaxies are showing now is the same galaxies, how their shapes are going to be distorted because of the presence of this matter. Okay. So, what you notice is that all of these uh, galaxies, they are getting tangentially elongated, right? They are getting stretched. And the stretch is also in a particular direction. So everywhere it looks like it's a tangential elongation, right? And as you go further and further away, this elongation becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, okay? So this is the uh, signature of lensing. And so even if you didn't know that there is a dark matter distribution around, if you see this particular pattern, now you can say that there has to be some dark matter there. Or some matter there, okay, which is causing the lensing. So if you can measure these distortions and measure these tangential distortions, then you are able to figure out uh, how much matter is there present in between those galaxies and us. Now, uh, just to uh, complicate this picture further, of course, you know that galaxies are not circular. Right? They will have their own intrinsic ellipticities and that will complicate this picture, right? Because now, one of these galaxies may be oriented like this, then it gets distorted, it moves uh, into some other direction and so on and so forth. So this signal and measurement of this signal is quite complicated. One of the biggest noise, uh, which is um, important for this signal is something called a shape noise. Is the intrinsic shapes of these galaxies. If, because we don't know exactly what they look like, it is harder to get this signal, but you can still get it statistically. And the reason behind it is, because of this particular pattern that you have, okay? So galaxies, their shapes will be completely randomly or mostly randomly oriented, right? And so if you can statistically average out and try to figure out whether there's this tangential distortion around some object, then, and you find it, then you can say that, yes, there is some matter there which is causing. So that's how you can go from uh, the, uh, the shapes of galaxies into maps of dark matter. So that's what we'll do. Um, the, in terms of the equations here, there's a quantity called this tangential distortion, which tells you how elongated these objects are. So if you can measure this, then it is related to the surface density average within a radius r minus the surface density at that radius r, okay? So this particular quantity is called the excess surface density, the numerator here, excess surface density. And this is divided by a quantity called sigma crit, the critical surface density. This critical surface density is a geometric factor. It depends upon how far the lens is from you and how far the source is from you and what is the distance between the lens and source. If you know this, then there is an expression for the critical surface density. 
So you take that, you take the excess surface density, divide by two, you get the tangential distortion that you need to see. Okay. So you measure this and you try to infer the surface density of that. Okay. So that's the name of the game. Now uh, let's come to the actual instrument that we use. So um, the, the telescope that we use is called the Subaru telescope. Uh, this is an 8.2 meter class telescope, which is located at Mauna Kea in Hawaii. So um, Hawaii is this beautiful island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, away from a lot of the light pollution that is there, right? And so um, this is one of the, not one of the, it is the best site for doing optical astronomy and infrared astronomy in the world. And so there's an eight meter class telescope there. It's operated by the National Astronomical Observatories of Japan. Um, and this is actually an engineering marvel, okay? So there is like a small thing here that you see, that's called, that's a camera of this telescope. It's at the prime focus of this uh, telescope. The camera itself weighs like ton, okay? So in order to hold that camera, you can imagine the feat of engineering that has to go in, uh, in order to build something like this, okay? Is the uh, largest field of view uh, that is there on a eight meter class uh, telescope. So at the same time, when you take an image, you can survey about nine times the area uh, of the moon itself okay? uh, in one single snapshot. And because it is an eight meter class telescope, um, it has a tremendous light gathering power, which means it can see very faint objects very quickly. So that's the reason why we use this. Um, and the other good thing, as I said, is the site itself, Mauna Kea, because it's uh, so remote and this is about 4.2 uh, kilometers above the sea level. Uh, the scene, which is uh, related to the blurring of uh, images that happens because of the atmosphere, it is very small. Okay. And because of this, uh, this is one of the best places uh, to, do, uh, to do this kind of science that I'm talking about. Finally, you want to measure the shapes of these galaxies. And so if there is less disturbance because of the atmosphere, of course, it is better for you uh, to measure these shapes. Okay, so then um, let me show you the survey that uh, data that I'm using. Uh, so this uh, particular uh, survey is called the Subaru Hypersupram Cam Survey because it's made with the Hypersupram Cam instrument, which is the camera on this telescope. Um, and so uh, what we have done is we have completed a survey of about 1200 square degrees uh, of the sky uh, using this particular telescope. We use five different filters, so five different wavelength bands uh, to look at galaxies. Uh, and what you are seeing here is the scene distribution. So the color scale here is the scene. And this ranges from uh, 0.3 to 0.4 at the bottom and about 0.9 arc seconds at the top. Okay? The scene is 0.9 arc seconds at most of the telescopes all over the world. This is only rarely that you get a, such a high scene at Mauna Kea. Okay? So um, the median this scene, the scene this is the scene map, yes. They are RADX and so oh, six different fields. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So six different patches of the sky. Now uh, they have been merged together. So this is uh, the data from the first year of collection. Now we have everything together. It's like two different parts of the sky that have been merged. And so the results that I'm going to talk about today are partly only from the first year of data. And we have about 10 times yeah, maybe I should go down or something. I know no, that's much. okay because the mic is also. Yeah, I think it's the connector. If I move down. Hey, yeah, we want to keep this down. ভাই <laughs> 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 Thank <laughs> you. 